Hello, everyone. I'm Bill Sanders, Dean of the College of Engineering. Uh, welcome to this presentation today. In August, the College of Engineering kicked off a new webinar series entitled Faculty Insights, a 20-minute briefing. This is the second uh, session in that series. In this series, faculty from across the College of Engineering will present insights into their research, its impact, and provide a perspective for the future. Following each presentation, attendees will have an opportunity to direct questions and comments to the speakers. Paulina Jaramillo is a, pres a professor of electrical, uh, excuse me, the professor of engineering and public policy at Carnegie Mellon University. She is the co-director of the Green Design Institute at CMU, a fellow of the Scott Institute for Energy Innovation and Research, and a research affiliate of the Kigali Collaborative Research Center. She also holds a courtesy appointment at CMU Africa. Finally, Haramio is the lead author for the IPCC Sixth Assessment Report as part of Working Group 3. Paulina's past research has focused on the life cycle assessment of energy systems with an emphasis on climate change aspects and mitigation research. She is currently involved in multidisciplinary research projects to better understand the social, economic, and environmental implications of policy-driven changes in the operations of the energy systems. Over the past five years, her research and education efforts have been expanded to include energy issues related to access and development in the Global South. She has also worked to work to incorporate values and beliefs in energy planning in historically disenfranchised communities and to understand the implications of energy access in gender equality. Nick Muller joined the Department of Engineering and Public Policy and the Tepper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon University as the Lester and Judith Lab Associate Professor of Economics, Engineering and Public Policy in 2017. He also serves as a co-director of the Green Design Institute. Prior to Carnegie Mellon, Nick was on the faculty at, at Middlebury College since the fall of 2007. He joined the National Bureau of Economic Research as a faculty research fellow in 2012, and he was promoted to research associate in the fall of 2013. Nick's research focuses on measuring air pollution damage and market-based policy design. His current work focuses on renewable energy systems, estimating air pollution and greenhouse gas damage from economic activity activity, air pollution and municipal finance systems, and inequality in both market and augmented measures of income. Paulina, Paulina and Nick, we thank you for being here today to share your research and insights. Before I turn things over to Paulina and Nick, please uh, let me tell you the questions you submit via the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen. They'll respond to them at the conclusion of the presentation. So Paulina and Nick, I'll turn it over to you and we're looking forward to your talk. Hello everyone and thanks uh, for joining us today. Uh, Nick and I are very excited to give you this webinar about the Green Design Institute at Carnegie Mellon. I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes, give you a brief overview of what the Institute is working on and then both Nick and I will give you some specific uh, information about research, examples of research we're doing. So at GDI at Carnegie Mellon, we, are, we aim to conduct, foster, and promote research that focuses on infrastructure and system growth in the developing world. And we are motivated by several, um, several issues that are coming up. Um, you may be aware that we are facing uh, multiple global crises, um, air pollution, water pollution and scarcity, ecosystem and habitat destruction, resource depletion, environmental degradation is a growing concern all over the world. We are seeing the impact of climate change right now. Um, it isn't something 
that will be in the long term future. We're seeing these impacts now, weather extremes, uh, sea level rise, storms, saltwater intrusion, fires, migration of tropical diseases, all of these things that could create, really create and are creating um, constraints um, all over the world. And globally, we still experience great inequalities. There's still, we still suffer from a concentration of wealth. Um, there's very stark differences in access to resources and, and information. We continue to see migration crises, conflicts, and war. So developing countries are the most vulnerable to the ravages of this global crisis. But also what happens in the developing world will determine the success or failure of global sustainability efforts. Um, so we at Carnegie Mellon University have done a lot of work on looking at sustainability issues in, in the US, in North America, um, in Europe. Um, growingly, we're also working on the context of developing countries because we really see what happens in these countries as critical to the success of global sustainability. We are not alone in this idea. In 2015, the United Nations established the Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 goals um, that aim to support economic and, and global development. They start with ending poverty. Um, they include affordable and clean energy access for everyone, include issues about clean water and sanitation, um, also, there's 17, you can see here, um, just some, an image from the UN that summarizes all of them. At Green Design Institute, we argue that access to modern infrastructure services is critical to meeting the sustainable development goals. And so I have here, I want to show you some numbers. I find them very stark um, in highlighting the need of infrastructure services uh, in, around the world. According to the International Energy Administration, 1.2 billion people in the world do not have access to electricity, and 3 billion people lack access to modern fuels for cooking and heating. On the water and sanitation side, the United Nations estimates that 2.1 billion people lack access to drinking water, and 4.5 billion people lack safely access to sanitation services. Other infrastructure systems, access to other infrastructure systems is lacking. There are still 3.5, 3.7 billion people that are not connected to the internet and more than 1, 1 billion people lack access to all weather roads and transport services, which have serious implications for economic development and human well-being. So with this background and this motivation um, in mind, at the Green Design Institute, we aim to develop research and education um, efforts that support decision making for sustainable infrastructure systems and global development. We have, so if we think of sustainable uh, global development at the center of the puzzle we're trying to complete, um, we have these four other er like key areas of research where we are working. Um, on in the Green Design Institute. Uh, we're an engineering college. We have really good people working in technology development. Um, so we do have people that are working on technology for infrastructure development and with focus in, with attention to the global south or developing countries. Um, then we have a lot, very long tradition of working in interdisciplinary research on system analysis and so um, in addition to working on technology development, we have research looking at how we integrate those technologies into the infrastructure systems in underserved communities in developing countries. Uh, engineers cannot work in, in, in a vacuum. And so at the Green Design Institute, we are actually co-housed uh, the, in the College of Engineering and the Tepper School of Business, and we aim to bring in experts in policy interventions, um, economics, that support investment and deployment of appropriate infrastructure systems in the global south. And finally, we wanna make sure that all of these interventions support global development are also environmentally sustainable and can help uh, mitigate 
the climate change. The Green Design uh, Institute leverages the strengths that we have with multi multidisciplinary research. As I mentioned, uh, I'm an engineer. Nick, who will be speaking shortly, is an economist. We also work with social science, social and decision scientists, um, other economists. So we really believe in multidisciplinary um, collaborations and we are leveraging our global presence. Um, many of you probably know that we have, the College of Engineering has um, connections all over the world. And I am particularly excited about our Kigali uh, campus. So the CMU Africa program uh, is, the, I, what I have here is a photo of the new campus that was recently inaugurated. We are the only top ranked Western university with a physical presence in, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa where we have CMU faculty and master's students pursuing a Carnegie Mellon education. And so we uh, in the Green Design Institute are really trying to integrate with the CMU Africa program. I have spent time at the C at, at Rwanda, in Rwanda at the CMU Africa program. And we have deep connections uh, with the faculty and the students there. Um, so this is kind of a background of what we're doing. I now want to show you some examples of PhD student research. Um, and first I will tell you about Joanne Nikoliki. She is working on low carbon energy systems in East Africa. She's one of the PhD students we have in the Department of Engineering and Public Policy. And she also received her master's degree from the CMU Africa program. Uh, so she has transitioned from our Kigali campus to the Pittsburgh campus. She is originally from Uganda, but is now in Pittsburgh working with me and a couple other faculty on this project. So East Africa is a, is a growing, um, has growing population. They have very low levels of energy consumption and energy infrastructure. Take Rwanda, for example. Uh, it's a country of 12 million people and the installed capacity of for power generation is less than 300 megawatts. Um, that's the size of a small power plant in the US for 12 million people. So economic development and well-being will really require that the that investments in the in the energy system in the region. And our hypothesis is that the marginal costs of building that infrastructure so that it's low or zero carbon pale in comparison to all of the other costs. And so Joanne has been building a complete database of energy resources and technologies for East Africa. She has also, we demand for energy services is very uncertain in areas of the world where we're just demand is only growing. So we're developing scenarios for demand for energy services based on different demographic socioeconomic pathways. And now she's putting all of these into this big model um, that will run with, that she will use to run simulations and um, test her hypothesis. Next, I wanna talk to you about Anna Cassidis um, and her research on climate induced constraints on hydropower plants in the global south. Anna is a PhD student um, in two departments, she's getting a dual PhD degree from engineering and public policy and from the civil and environmental engineering department. She's originally from Peru, but has been in Pittsburgh for several years now working on this project. And the motivation or the hypothesis in this project uh, is that climate, climate change will lead to changes in hydrological systems and those changes could create new constraints for the operations of hydropower plants in developing countries. Uh, this is important because developing countries currently are very reliant on hydropower. Uh, plants, places in South America have their capacity, more than 70% of their capacity come for generating electricity from, comes from hydropower. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa has a lot of hydropower potential. And so hydropower could, it's already critical in some systems and could really be um, a key resource to improve energy access. So it is important to understand what, what could happen to those power plants under climate change scenarios. 
Anna has built a reduced form hydrological model using uh, remote sense data and climate projections that are publicly available to estimate um, what could be the available capacity at hydropower plants in the future. So this figure shows some results of her simulations for what the capacity of individual uh, power plants in Peru could look like in uh, the period between 2070 and 2090. She's looked already, she's used her model already to evaluate Brazil, Colombia, uh, and Peru. We're looking now at um, Rwanda and other um, sub-Saharan African countries. Quickly, I, I also want to show you work by Jorge Izar, who is also a PhD student in EPP, and is working at the intersection of electricity use and agricultural productivity. This is, pro this is a project funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and even though Jorge is working on East Africa issues, he's originally from Mexico. Um, the hypothesis here is that there are opportunities to expand use of electricity for irrigation in East Africa, which would increase agricultural productivity, but could also provide or serve as anchor loads for utilities in East Africa. And so he, Jorge has developed a techno-economic model and has now estimated the cost of irrigation, how much electricity would be needed for that irrigation, what is the water availability and the agricultural productivity for different crops in, um, in East African countries. We've looked at Ethiopia, Rwanda, and Uganda, He's looked at tomatoes, uh, wheat production, potato, um, and other key um, staple crops. So those are examples of the PhD student work. We have also started a couple of larger scale research efforts that are in the early stages. Uh, one of those is the Africa Air Network, uh, which is a very collaborative effort we are the Green Design Institute at Carnegie and Carnegie Mellon and the Center for Atmospheric Particles and Studies at Carnegie Mellon is involved. We also have partners from the University of Sydney, the University of Cape, Cape Coast, the University of Rwanda, Columbia University. And what we've been doing is deploying um, low cost sensors, a network of low, low cost air quality sensors to um, measure air quality, which is a significant problem in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, here I have some photos of us. I'm actually in one of those photos is that installing the low cost sensors uh, in Kigali, where we manage, Carnegie Mellon actually manages these sensors. Our partners from those other institutions also have uh, installed these, these sensors in other nine cities. Uh, with this work, we conducted the first of its kind. Uh, study in Kigali that demonstrated the use of low-cost air quality monitors. We had some interesting findings about concentrations of air pollutants, uh, but they are typically higher than World Health Organization standards. Uh, we have several hypotheses about the sources of emissions, how they may different, may be different in, in, a, in a place like Kigali um, compared to a place like Pittsburgh. Uh, but it is very clear that we need additional monitoring um, all over the continent to better understand spatial differences um, and inform exposure model, modeling um, for, to support decision making in the region. Um, so Nick is now going to talk about the other large scale effort that we are pursuing. So I will turn my camera off. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Polly. Um, thanks again uh, for the invitation to be a part of this uh, webinar. This is uh, really an excellent opportunity. What I want to talk about is a project on global environmental accounting that is currently underway with one of our uh, PhD students from the EPP department, Anirudh Mohan, and I are working on this project. And the, the genesis of this project really came out of an of a environmental economics class that Ani took uh, that I was offering. And I had presented results akin to what you will see here for the United States. And Ani, who is from India, started asking about, you know, if, if you applied these tools in other parts of the world, how different would the results look? And so we embarked on this project um, and gathered uh, really a, a, an amazing amount of data 
to conduct environmental accounting for air pollution and CO2 over 160 countries, obviously spanning uh, a wide range of income and, and development uh, paths between 1998 and essentially the present of 2018. Some of the data is really interesting for um, areas in the world where we don't have actual monitors for local air pollution, akin to what Paulina was just referring to, we used um, satellite-based data sources that are globally comprehensive um, to get an approximation of air quality levels in, in these unmonitored locations. We gathered data from the World Bank and other sources on emissions of the primary greenhouse gases. And then what we did was we employed a whole series of uh, peer-reviewed methods that have been applied in benefit cost analyses and regulatory impact analyses in a variety of different settings to monetize the value of health and climate damages. And I'll show you some of those results beginning with the ambient concentration data on the next slide. Paulina? Great. So what you can see here are results for the eight largest economies in the world as of 2018. And by largest economies, I mean the magnitude of their GDP in purchasing power parity terms. And so really what I want to emphasize from this slide are essentially two patterns. One, in the developed economies, you see much lower levels of ambient particulate matter. So this is uh, com components and constituents of smog. And in those economies, for the most part, you see a subtle downward trajectory as those economies are on a cleaning up path. In contrast, in China and India, you see much, much higher pollution levels, not surprisingly, and you see different trajectories, right? China got uh, much more polluted up until about 2010 or 2012, and then has cleaned up considerably, again, according to the satellite data, and India is still on that upward trajectory. Next slide, please. What we see here is, a, is a, the same economies, but looking at CO2 emissions. These are annual totals. And again, you can see those two patterns really coming through in this graph. On the one hand, we have relatively flat trajectories for the developed economies and lower levels, although not uniformly so. And we see starkly different uh, patterns for India and China with uh, very steep increases. China has just re recently begun to, to taper off in its growth rate. Um, and India is really still in that exponential uh, rate of growth in its, in its CO2 emissions. Next slide, please. So what we have here is the sum total of the impacts from air pollution and the damages from CO2 emissions by country divided by the GDP of that country. So we are taking the external cost, the monetary damages from these pollutants, and we're normalizing those by the, the level of economic output in those countries. And then what you see here is aggregating those countries up to different income categories. And not surprisingly, you can see that the high income countries have gotten cleaner over time as expressed by this pollution damage intensity measure, where damages were about 10% of GDP in 1998 and fallen to about 6% in uh, 2018. And just the opposite pattern happening in the upper middle income countries. And I'm sure many of you uh, watching this are intuiting that the key driver in that upper middle income category is China. And I'm also sure that a number of you are intuiting that it's trade flows that have in part generated this reversal in some sense in the relative pollution intensities of these economies. Um, and that's a really, really important insight that comes from this research as we are able to, to now globally integrate both the satellite monitoring networks, the CO2 emissions data, um, and the accounting tools that allow us to express these damages relative to the value of products produced. In the bottom left, the key driver here is India. And it's just starting to show an uptick in pollution damage intensity in the, the later years of our sample. And that's really being driven by, as I said, by the Indian economy. And then the final thing on this slide that I want to point out 
as Paulina was talking about the uh, very uh, early stage development slash low income countries, we don't see a lot of energy use and therefore we don't see a lot of combustion related uh, pollution or CO2 relative to output. And furthermore, we don't see a lot of growth. And so you can see this relatively flat line in the bottom right and at a very low level of pollution intensity. The thing I wanna note here is how crucial it therefore is for the global community to think about ways to intervene in these economies to facilitate leapfrogging, where we move from uh, very low subsistence levels of income to higher levels of income to skip things like uh, reliance on, on fuels like lignite and coals that are so uh, pollution and damage intensive. It's really an opportunity and it's quite crucial for global outcomes. Next slide, please. Um, so zeroing in on China, um, this, is, this is a really obviously a globally important case and an interesting case. I won't spend too much time here, but just to note that uh, we do see a change in the trajectory from uh, the, the global satellite data and from the emissions data. You can see those in, in the top two panels of the graph. And then interestingly, what you see is prior essentially to the financial crisis, 2008, 2009, you see an exponential growth rate in pollution and CO2 damages from the Chinese economy. And then that linearizes, right? It, it doesn't flatten yet. It's still growing, um, but it's linearized. And so it's incremental progress, but it's important progress in, in bending that damage curve. Next slide, please. So um, just some key takeaways. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Uh, I think I've already gone over. Um, the, the pollution intensity in the developed world is, is falling. China appears to have turned a corner. Ambient pollution is falling, and the growth in greenhouse gas emissions is slowing, though still positive. India is really poised to repeat this example. We need to think carefully about that as a, as a uh, global community. I already mentioned the, the case of the low-income countries um, and the need to intervene. Next slide. Um, in terms of future work, this current work really documents emissions, concentrations, exposures, and impacts as we observe them in place, right? This is observational work. What we'd like to begin work on, and this is really a critical component to under, understanding uh, the impact of trade flows and the interjurisdictional flows of pollution, are integrated assessment models that track the emissions as they cross geopolitical boundaries. So for instance, when we look at damages in South Korea, for instance, we can't attribute what we know is an appreciable fraction of those damages back to the Chinese economy as they lie downwind of, of China's industrial centers. That's a critical modeling piece um, that remains to be done and, and is one we're, we're really looking to embark on. Um, one more slide, I believe. And, and this issue is the one I raised earlier, right? Which is as the developed economies have deindustrialized, that industrial capacity, as many of us know, has, has moved to other parts of the world. This graph and the, and the circle really picks that up. It picks up the trade-offs in terms of uh, the location of production and pollution. Um, and to really um, rigorously model that, in both an engineering and an economic sense. We need the models that are gonna link emissions, transport, and exposure back to the sources of production and emissions. So I think that's my final slide. Yeah, thanks again for your attention, and we're here now to, to, to talk with you all. Thank you, Paulina and Nick, for a great presentation, and that was very informative. Thank you for joining us, and thank you to everyone who's, who's uh, joining us online here today, and we appreciate you being here. My name is Gina Henry. I'm the Associate Dean for Advancement for the College of Engineering uh, at Carnegie Mellon, and I'm going to be helping uh, Nick and Paulina um, with some of the Q&A. And so this is just a reminder that if you do have a question for um, either of our presenters, please type that into the Q&A box. And Paulina and Nick, we've already had a couple of questions come through. So um, let's start off with, with this one. There was a question about um, partnering with um, industry it, to address social and environmental issues and whether that is something that the Green Design Institute does. 
uh, also the secondary question is who would who would uh, people contact um, if they have interest in, in partnering? Um, yeah, so in, in East Africa, because we have the campus there and we've spent time in, on, in living in Kigali, we have really good connections, uh, particularly with the utilities. Um, the Rockefeller Foundation, and I'm not sure if there's someone from the Rockefeller Foundation online, but uh, big thanks to the Rockefeller Foundation for their support. Um, with them, we have, and a couple of universities, we, can, we have a, a big effort to understand energy growth uh, and energy access issues. And those, uh, for that work, we have been partnering uh, with the utilities. We also have very deep connections with some of the mini grid developers and the companies that energy companies that are working that there. Um, we have, for example, also supported internships for students in the CMU Africa program to go and spend in with companies in the sector. And so uh, through the funding with the Rockefeller Foundation, um, so we are really interested in, in partners and we think that um, understanding the context on the ground is really important when we're working on issues of development. And so having local partners and really having that stakeholder engagement so that the solutions uh, and the problems we work on are context relevant. Um, you can email uh, me or Nick, if you have any interest, um, I think you could also contact Gina uh, in that if you have interest. Of course, thank you, Paulina. And you see that um, we should have, you should be able to see Paulina and Nick's email up on screen and mine will be attached to um, the follow-up email that comes out with the link to this recording. Um, okay, Paulina and Nick. Nick, sorry, next uh, question. Uh, there's been a question around um, uh, nuclear reactors. So uh, the comment was the East African situation sounds like it's ideal for small nuclear reactors with uh, the uh, distributed generation and lots of heat to make uh, water that could be drinkable. Can you address uh, that, that comment? Yeah, I, I personally don't necessarily disagree with that statement and uh, small modular reactors in, in the project that I mentioned that Joan Nikriki is working on where we're doing technology characterization, um, which includes understanding their costs, their performance characteristics, um, and also understanding what are the services they can meet. Uh, nuclear, small nuclear reactor is one of the technologies we're including. Um, I think uh, small nuclear reactors still suffer from, well, commercial, commercial availability still, there's only a very few, um, if any commercially available SRN, um, as an SNR, sorry, and um, cost, right? We are talking, one of the big challenges is in meeting low levels of energy access is cost, is there, it's limiting. Um, so anything we can do to support cost reductions in these new technologies is probably um, useful. But again, we are considering, we are including that in our analysis, including the opportunity, the potential opportunities for small nuclear reactors. One thing I would add to that is the, the cost comparison, how we do this is, is really critical. And, and by that, I mean, um, the evaluation on some level would be between the levelized cost of energy or dollar per kilowatt hour for coal versus nuclear or gas versus nu nuclear in, in those terms. It should also build in the external costs that are associated with both of those technologies. And, and when you do that in a rigorous way, um, coal is generally not cost competitive with many of the other technologies. And so as we make these infrastructure and capital planning decisions broadly, um, the, the costs really need to be inclusive of those, uh, of those additional sources of, of value. Great, thank you both. The next question is uh, geared toward uh, policy and regulation. So uh, we, we got the question, is the Green Design Institute partnering with governments or other policymakers to translate the findings of the research into potential policies and regulations? So my answer to that is related to the one about uh, partners um, in other, in, in, just with industry. Um, in, in East Africa specifically, um, 
the utilities are government owned. Uh, so when I talk when when I mentioned that we're working with the government utilities, I mean with the electric utility power system utilities, they are government uh, run. So we are working with these um, with the government organizations that are in charge of planning. We also are working with some of the private uh, investors that are working on in the energy space. Um, but definitely working with the with the government. For example, um, another way, another in the project I mentioned about um, hydropower that Anna is working on, we also have um, the we reached out to the energy Rwanda Energy Group, which is the main energy like the utility in Rwanda. And they there there's a lot of interest in hydropower, micro hydropower in Rwanda, and so we talked to them and. Some of the analysis we're doing for the region is um, based on the interest and with collaboration and communication with the Rwanda Energy Group. Yeah, one thing I would add is, is part of the challenge is um, conveying to governments at the domestic level the international importance of local decision making, right? And so part of the impetus to build the country to country integrated assessment models tracking flows that I was talking about at the conclusion of my slides is the ability to convey to governments their role in contributing to environmental quality in, in neighboring and or downwind states. And, and that is uh, inclusive of the notion of the contribution to, to global issues like climate change. Thank you both. Um, we have uh, we have a question about indoor air quality um, and mitigate pollution mitigation indoors. Is there anything that you could say about uh, research around that area? Yeah, so indoor is a it's a really big problem in developing countries um, in sub-Saharan Africa, in um, Asia as well, in developing Asia. Currently, the work we are doing, we CMU specifically is doing with Africa Air, has focused on um, outdoor air quality because it turns out outdoor air quality is actually even less studied than indoor air quality in some of these contexts. Some of the partners in the Africa Air Network have been doing work um, on indoor um, and a lot of work. Some of our faculty have done work on, for example, uh, the air quality implications of um, uh, cookstoves, advanced cookstoves, high efficiency cookstoves. Um, so there is some, but with Africare, we really are uh, doing a lot with low carb, with low cost sensors for for outdoor area pollution. Uh, because the other thing is there, there is with urbanization. There's also a growing concern about the shift in the sources of pollution and the shift towards more problematic outdoor air quality issues. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Good. Yeah, Thank just you. broadly, this has been a thorny issue in, in the, the side of epidemiologists and, and public health uh, scientists studying pollution impacts for a long time. And one of the dimensions about this in the developing world that is uniquely challenging is the um, relatively free exchange of outdoor air to indoor air that is very different than in the developed world with just the difference in in um, the nature of structures and so that's that's really an important consideration and one that's being increasingly paid attention to in the empirical research good thank you uh another question what ratio of renewable to non-renewable energy is a realistic goal to shoot for in, in these developing countries Nick, do you want to try? I can, I can try. Um, to, 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 to my way of thinking about how to answer that question, it's going to depend on, on two things. It's going to depend on at least two things, I should say. What types of renewables and what types of non-renewables we're talking about. Because optimality with respect to that ratio is going to be very different if we're talking about coal or if we're talking about natural gas. Now, both of those are non-renewable, both of them emit carbon when consumed, but they have very different um, emission factors when thinking about 
not only carbon, but also some of the local air pollutants. Um, if we're talking about um, renewables that rely on battery technology for storage, the answer to that question is going to evolve um, pretty significant thinking about the supply chain impacts and where the, the materials that are part of the battery technology are coming from. Um, if we're talking about uh, small scale hydropower, we need to think about a different set of impacts. So my honest answer is, I don't know that there is one answer to that question. I think it's very much going to be case dependent and time dependent. Yeah, so I, I also think there are very strong advantages right now to renewables uh, and it isn't just wind and solar. Wind, for example, is actually not very, there's not much activity in Sub-Saharan Africa on wind, but there's a lot going on with solar and even in, with geothermal. Hydro is a, I mean, I've already said there are some countries in, develop, in the developing, developing world where more than 60 to 70 percent of their electricity comes from, from hydropower, which is a renewable resource. And the operating constraints on the power system are also very different uh, for depending on the profile of generation from the different, from the different renewable resources. Um, so I think I think the hypothesis we have in the in in one of the project in Joanne's project is that we can get to significant shares of renewable resources. The question is which renewable resources mixed and it's always going to be a mix. We should not be putting all of our um, what is it eggs in one basket. Uh, it should it, it can't if we if, if we we put we get, become vulnerable. The systems become vulnerable. Uh, but there, I think there's no question that renewables in developing countries are playing an increasing and are being competitive. Um. Good. Uh, so I have a question now directed to Nick that's related to this. Um, uh, so this participant said that I understand it on outsourcing manufacturing from the developed world to India and China, uh, exporting the um, pollution and uh, the concomitant pollution and production processes. It also raises their need for polluting fossil burnings of um, coal for water pumping and electricity generation prior to manufacturing um, pollution. Can you normalize your data to highlight this, not just divide by GDP? Perhaps you can net uh, out against imports of uh, manufactured consumer and industrial durable goods back to other countries. I see, I see. Um, so there's, there's uh, at least two parts to that that are, that are really interesting. One is, um, to implement that as a research problem, we would need, which I think is available, but we would need the, the global input output tables. So by that, I mean, we, we would need to know where firms in, let's just say India, are uh, importing various inputs to their production process from, right? And so we would then have the capacity to, to normalize differently as that participant suggested. Um, but it would also then, give us the opportunity to think about policy interventions in those contexts that might modify how producers in those locations and where producers in those locations are acquiring inputs from, right? So if, if we've got uh, a carbon tax or some sort of intervention that's going to raise the relative cost of dirtier inputs, then that's going to modify the sort of implicit supply chains that, that those um, industries in those firms are currently relying on. But it really does, it requires on, in this case, not the pollution country to country modeling, but it requires the country to country economic modeling to capture those value chain flows. Okay, um, do you want me to do, go ahead, Gina? So there's a comment in the Q&A um, about uh, corruption and the national util in the national utilities in developing countries and how, um, how there are some institutional and government fraud um, in these countries that I guess maybe are affecting or affect investments in, in infrastructure. Um, I'm originally from Colombia, so I'm never going to argue that there is no corruption in developing countries. Um, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, I think there's 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 been corruption and grift and all of that, but there's also 
uh, the role of international organizations in what type of projects they support. And uh, for a long time, international organizations would only, would only fund large scale mega projects with coal plants. We see it now with um, certain countries really investing in or pushing for investments in even in coal development in, 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 in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and so there are also, there's definitely a lot of challenges both within the government institutions and from the way the, the developed countries have intervened in supporting um, energy and infrastructure development. Um, the, the utility death spiral is definitely real. I, there's no, I don't think there's any utilities in Sub-Saharan Africa that are not in the red. And some of that is um, probably fraud, uh, corruption. But also, I mean, you're building infrastructure from scratch, it's expensive, and you're trying to meet the needs of very poor customers that use very little electricity and have very low um, purchasing power. So that's why at the Green Design, we also are very interested, not just in the technical, but also in what are the institutional and governance structures that need to be in place to enable uh, sustainability. It's not enough for us in, in Pittsburgh to come up with a really cool technology and go and tell people in rural um, Kenya or rural Colombia, like this is the technology you should be using without really understanding what they need. Um, there's a long history of infrastructure investment failures as a result of not accounting for those social context issues. Great, Paulina, thank you so much for jumping in and thank you to everybody who's submitting questions. We're getting a lot of great um, questions and comments. So I really appreciate it. It makes the uh, conversation very lively. So thank you. Uh, we have um, another question about the costs to deploy technologies and somebody saying they would really enjoy a deep dive into that that cost because there are some real implications to the cost for for countries to deploy technologies the generation the transmission and distribution of all those and the ability of the populations um, to pay uh, this is sort of related to what you were just mentioning paulina so can you talk about if if there's any perspective you have on that um, angle Oh. One thing I would reiterate, sorry, just jumping in, is uh, when we think about costs, there are the engineering sort of direct investment costs, there are operations and maintenance, and all of those are critically important as the participant uh, intuited. What I would also note is that at the stage where we are evaluating alternatives, in some sense building from the ground up uh, in some locations, it is critical to rank and evaluate full cost, social cost, not just direct uh, investment costs, right? So as we think about either supply chain implications and, and uh, the embedded environmental cost of inputs or post-combustion post costs, we need to do our best uh, to, to include both to try to get a comprehensive assessment of complete cost comparisons. Um, yeah, so one of the big challenges we've had with the work on, on, on understanding pathways is um, there, like we've done a lot of work in modeling energy systems in developed countries and understanding cost structures and how much does it cost and what the performance is and what are the resources and the supply costs of different energy technologies. That's not true everywhere in the world. In, in East Africa, we've had a, a challenge, no, like we've, there's been a lot of work on basic energy access and electrification and mini grids versus solar home systems. But looking at larger scale use of energy for industrial development and for transportation, it, it, is, it hasn't been done. Um, and the, one of the big things we've been working on is on developing that database. So I can't give you too many insights on costs and trajectories, but that is one of the things that we're trying to do with that work. Um, I think the person that asked this question asked about foreign exchange rates. Uh, and we have seen that as a big challenge for, for example, mini grid developers uh, who have debt in dollars, but their customers are low paying, have low ability to pay and are paying in current, in local currencies. 
And so I think there's the, one of the things we've been talking about is that's also some interesting things about how we structure uh, aid um, and support for decarbonization projects in these countries, accounting for the foreign exchange concerns. Thanks to you both. Um, this may be a question more for Paulina, but uh, there's been a, a question submitted about uh, asking for a little bit more information about the CMU Africa campus and how that is integrated with um, uh, CMU as a whole and the rest of the community and whether they have connections with local schools or NGOs. So maybe you can talk just a little bit about the, about the structure there. Okay, well, you can also talk about that, but I'll, 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 I'll do what I can. So, yeah, so we have a physical campus. Uh, we are there with, under an agreement with the government of Rwanda and with the support of the government of Rwanda. Uh, it is a Pan-African Pan institution, so we have students, I think, from at least 15 African countries. Um, and we have faculty that are on the ground in Rwanda. Those faculty also have spent time or spent time in Pittsburgh and increasingly we're seeing more and more interest from faculty in Pittsburgh spending time in in the campus in, in Kigali so that we can strengthen the the connection between the two campuses there are students from the from the campus in Rwanda that um, every semester well I guess not this semester but normally in every semester there's a couple of the students from the CMU Africa program that come to Pittsburgh so that's in terms of the relationship between the two campuses. In terms of relationship with the local um, organizations, um, for example, the work we've, we've been doing with, with um, Africa, uh, with Air Africa, that has been heavily, um, we have been working very closely with the University of Rwanda and the Rwanda Environmental Management Agency and the Rwanda Climate Observatory which are all things that are got like local institutions. Similarly, in work we're doing in Nigeria, we're working very closely with the, with the well, local, local organizations and some, like we're working with some, on looking at some like markets, electrification of markets. And so we've been working with uh, local stakeholders that operate in those, on those markets. Um, I've been always, I mean, I think Esther, uh, who's one of the CMU Africa students was online. She was involved with the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences, which is one another university with whom we've been trying to maintain connections. And so um, it's a perfect no, but we are um, working a lot to make those connections. And the faculty at CMU Africa are also working with colleagues at Makerere University and even in some universities in, in Ghana. Um, I don't know, Gina, if you have other things to add. I think that's perfect, Paulina. Thank you for, thank you for answering that. Um, it's a pretty impressive program. Um, so there's a question about uh, politics and how that might, political ideologies, and how that might influence um, environmental policy, and how prevalent that is throughout the world, and if, if we see this as, as being something that you encounter in your research. Um, I, would, I would weigh in here and, and say that um, I, I think most of us would recognize that the way in which even the most well-intentioned environmental or energy policies actually play out as critically dependent on not only institutional capacity, as, as we discussed, but also political systems and um, the, I'm trying to be uh, uh, delicate here, the, uh, the way in which um, individual contexts in different countries reflect the needs of constituents. And so part of the role is to try to convince local institutions that external effects beyond their borders matter. And if that fails, we, we have to do the best we can to convince those local institutions and actors to at least mitigate the damages and the impacts that are happening domestically. And in lots of cases, we don't even see that, right? So 
Um, I think politics and institutions matter incredibly, and we need to think how those affect the ultimate implementation of policies we might um, recommend. Good, thank you very much. Um, so uh, we, have, we have time for one final question. So uh, if, if you did not uh, get a chance to ask the question that's uh, burning on the top of your brain, please go ahead and submit that to the Q&A and we'll try to do it after the fact. But I think that we have covered um, at least most of the questions, if not all of them that have come in um, through the Q&A. Um, uh, so the, the last question is around big data. Um, and and um, maybe Paulina, you can talk a little bit about um, big data and how this is used in, in some of the modeling with um, one of the questions that's come in. Yeah, so that question has several um, parts, right? One is we definitely are getting more information, like for example, with smart meters on electricity use, and, uh, and we are leveraging the use, um, the access to that data. Although the data availability in some of these regions, like big data is on, only works if there is actual data. <laughs> and in some of these regions, data are actually lacking. Now, the other part is uh, modeling population migration from fail crops, fail states, and all of those um, things. I, ha I submitted a proposal to the National Science Foundation about three times to look at um, using data analytics um, and historical data to understand uh, the relationship between climate and agriculture and um, social conflict in sub-Saharan Africa. I didn't get, get it funded, uh, so we haven't been able to pursue it, but it, it, was, it was an idea we, we were really excited about pursuing. It, it's still, I think, relevant and interesting. We just haven't had the support for it. Thank you, Paulina. Um, so I think that takes us to the end of our session. I'd like to thank everybody that we have uh, online here for joining us, and I would like to um, very much thank uh, Paulina Jaramillo and Nick Muller for presenting today on the Green Design Institute. I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation today, and I hope you will uh, join us for the next, uh, next uh, Faculty Insight Seminar that we have. Paulina and Nick, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.